Your Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is a pleasure to participate again in this fourth edition of FII, as it brings together leaders from across the globe who dare to dream of a bold and shared future. I would like to congratulate first of all the PIF for holding this important gathering in such challenging and unusual times. I'm honored to be joined by a distinguished panel of business leaders to discuss the future of infrastructure investment. Traditionally, infrastructure has referred to real assets in transportation, utilities, and social infrastructure, like schools and hospitals. This is what allowed people to interact, innovate, produce. And indeed, improving art infrastructure has helped lift hundreds of millions out of poverty and increase access to water, sanitation, and public services. Today, the pace of investment is slowing despite the evidence of a continual need for investment. The infrastructure gap globally is estimated at over $15 trillion, and the IMF estimates that a 1% increase in public investment has the potential to increase GDP by 0.7%, private investment by 10%, and to create between 20 and 33 million jobs directly and indirectly. Other studies even suggest that Every country improved border administration and infrastructure to half of global standards, world GDP would be higher by almost 5%. Yet, the infrastructure story is not complete without thinking about technology infrastructure. Technology is no longer but rather power, literally and figuratively, the whole way of life. And this has only brought into star contrast during this pandemic, helping students to learn, people to some to continue working, and opportunity to keep our sanity by staying in touch with each other. So the infrastructure discussion today is not only about roads, but also about data cables, not only about building schools, but also online coding classes, not only about power stations, but also about data centers. However, governments are constrained at present. They cannot address of their own public investment needs. With fiscal balances highly stretched, the only effort for starting this infra or stopping this infrastructure gap is private sector participation in infrastructure investing. Governments have a duty to better provide for the frameworks necessary for PPP to succeed. The model of Saudi Arabia where we are today is instructive. A key driver of Vision 2030 is attracting private investment, both domestic and foreign. In addition to legislative and regulatory reforms, which we heard about yesterday, Saudi Arabia also recognized the need for a local enabler to spearhead and lend and lead this effort before other private investors can participate. And this has proven quite a success to date. It's 2000. In PIF established 10 new sectors, more than 30 companies, and created more than 330,000 new jobs. And only a few days ago, His Royal Highness Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman announced the PIF meant to invest $40 billion, equivalent to 5% of GDP in Saudi Arabia each year. With this introduction, please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel today. His Excellency Mr. Mohammed Al Abbar, Board of Trustees member of FII Institute, founder and chairman of Imar Properties, Brent Bechtel, CEO of Bechtel Construction, Josh Eaton, co founder and CTO of Virgin Hyperloop, and Matt Harris, co founder Global Infrastructure Partners. My first question to all the, part, to all the panelists is. What are the priority infrastructure investments that need to be made in the post-pandemic period, and how can they be financed? We will start with Abu Rashid, Mr. Al Abbar. Uh, thank you so much, and congratulations uh, for everyone involved uh, in this amazing uh, gathering during these challenging times. You know, there is a young kid uh, uh, within our family. He's, he's one of the smartest kids. Four, four years ago, I asked him, and I said, Listen, what are the most important things in your life? 
Uh, he said, oh, I can't think of much uh, Wi-Fi. I said, okay, next. He said, I can't think of anything else. I said, can't be. Uh, what about like your parents are not the most important thing? He said, no, I can do a video call and send him video on WhatsApp. I said, well, what about eating? He said, no, I can order the food, uncle. I mean, what's important? What about the food? You know, I said, well, school and all that. He said, yeah, exactly. We can connect. And I said, no, what about air? He said, oh, I, I didn't get this one. <laughs> yes, I agree. So you are right, Dr. Bassem. I really think that when we talk about infrastructure uh, and we understand that, that you know, we all need the roads, we all need the hospitals and, and the schools and the rest of it at the airports, but really the importance of the, of the digital ecosystem. You know, I don't want to talk about the Wi-Fi or the digital solution, but you know, everybody is talking now about digital, digital ecosystem. And I really think that if you look at our e-commerce giant Noon, you can realize that our e-commerce business is not really about Wi-Fi and you place an order on the website, but what goes beyond that, you know, the, the talent that you need, which is, I think, the best thing for infrastructure is talent, talent number one. But then after that, how does this thing work? How does it actually happen? It's not about the warehousing. It's not about the technology. It's not about the improvement of the technology on an ongoing basis. It's not about payment. It's about merchandise, variety, return, customer service, you name it. So, but, but today, uh, I think Saudi Arabia sets an incredible example where if you were to look at uh, infrastructure, of course, we need it all. We need the digital uh, ecosystem, which is evolving and changing all the time, and society is going that way, and especially after the virus uh, situation, pretty much everybody is, uh, is going uh, that way. But then again, to, for the digital infrastructure to uh, ecosystem to operate, you still need the old boring stuff. You still need the hospitals for the well-being of people. You still need the roads. You still need the airports. You still need the warehouses. Um, and I think uh, you've said it in the document that you sent me, Dr. Basim, is that with the pandemic and with the pressure on government budgets, I really think that the private sector will play such a critical role, uh, not only because they have the ability to, to fund, but they are able to be efficient and they are able to, to invest uh, as well. They are, uh, I guess, I guess uh, with speed and, and efficiency, even though, even though some countries have proven that they can do that well. And unfortunately, I give examples in the Middle East. We have few countries. I give Singapore as an example. I give China as an incredible example. Thank you, sir. We'll move to Josh. Uh, would you like to answer the question? If you'd like me, I can repeat the question, which is what are the priority infrastructure projects that you think should happen in the post-pandemic period and who should finance them? I think for us, for everybody, it's really the idea of connectivity. So this view that throughout the history of time, as we've been more connected, both digitally and physically, there has been more growth, there's been more response. You know, starting this company in a garage, the idea was to connect physically. And what we've noticed over the last year is that we haven't been able to connect physically. And so when we took that first ride, and I took that first ride as a passenger you know, three months ago, it was really kind of the culmination, the beginning of what we're calling kind of this Hyperloop decade. So it starts off with myself being the first person on it. By the end of this decade, you, us, will all be able to ride Hyperloops, billions of people on it. But again, it's people still need the backbone, as you pointed out, Your Excellency, that there's still the backbone of things, of goods, of connection that are going to power this. And so the way we're going to power that moving forward in the 21st century is with ideas, it's with the technology that actually enables it. It allows an on-demand, fast, sustainable, low energy footprint, compact transportation system for both people and for goods. And then beyond that, it gives the ability to create jobs, create opportunities for people both building it, um, as, as, as the Bechtel group knows, but also operating the system but from the, the digital operating, from the artificial intelligence that controls where the vehicles go, when the vehicles go. It really is a you know, 21st century solution for the 21st century opportunities. I haven't heard anything about the financing part. Who's going to finance all this? So I think governments need to support. They need to support from a number of different ways, from you know, regulatory aspects, but also when we look at projects in India, those can be 
model kind of private financing, the amount of ridership that's there. When we look at models here in the Middle East, I think there's public-private partnerships that enable the connectivity to be there because there's a demand, there's wider economic benefits from being able to get places faster. We heard His Royal Highness talk about growing Riyadh to 15 to 20 million past people before. This is, where do they come from? Where do they live? How are they getting into the city? How are they getting access? And so government's ability to create through land rights, through s subsidies, or through um, incentives, through partnerships, or through economic development and uh, you know, transit-oriented development standpoint, all can give partnership opportunities. It's going to be government helping. It's not going to be fully government supporting. So when do we see the hyperloop between Riyadh and Neon, Josh? Well, this is the decade of Hyperloop, so uh, I hope sooner rather than later. Uh, but I think the opportunity is here to, here to Neom in 90 minutes, but it's here to the entire GCC. It's the hub of three continents, and that's really what we're trying to do. And that means more than just here to Neom. That's thousands of kilometers here in the, in the region. Uh, but I'm, I'm hopeful it's going to be sooner rather than later. So, By 2030 or before? <laughs> It's a loaded question, but uh, I'm hoping by before 2030. Okay, we'll hold you to that. Matt, can I ask you the same question if possible? Absolutely, and, and uh, it's great to be here. Thank you, and congratulations again to the FII for such a successful event. The way I think about priorities really revolves around the energy transition. And as we sit here today, we're you know, on this track towards transitioning our global energy system in order to comply with the Paris Accords. And that's a major undertaking. Um, it's important, in my opinion, to also recognize that it's a transition. There's a significant amount of dialogue out there around the proliferation of renewable energy, which is important. But uh, ma many people, I think, see that at the expense of fossil fuels. And I think it's important to realize that doing something that is not a well thought out transition will compromise people's rightful access to energy, which is one of the primary ways people are lifted out of poverty. Not only in new energy and new energy technology, but also traditional energy systems, power, utilities, LNG. The way that, that we think about it is you've got two or three critical buckets of investment, um, of which there is a significant amount of private investment today, but governments are going to have to play a significant role. If you look at government energy R&D across the world, it's about 1% versus something like pharma at 13 or 14%. So governments are going to have to play a major role. When we think about new energy technology, we think not only about solar and wind, but also about batteries, about biofuels, about direct air capture, carbon capture, utilization, and storage. All of these areas need significant investment. On the power and utility front, huge advantage as we manage this transition. And investing in our networks to provide greater opportunity for electrification, figuring out how we're going to use these systems for charging electric vehicles is critically important. The last piece of, uh, of, of investment I would mention is gas. Gas, in my opinion, is going to play a very critical bridge fuel role, and particularly liquefied natural gas, which is growing at almost 3% versus the gas industry itself at something more like 1% to 1.5%. So investing in the globalization of the gas industry is a huge piece of this transition that we're all in process of making. As I mentioned, we can use government here to help us boomerang out of this depression that we've had coming out of COVID. Government investment in energy infrastructure will not only create jobs, but it'll help us manage our way through this unique transition that we're making. What about the technology part, Matt? I mean, how do you integrate technology in energy infrastructure development? Yesterday, we heard uh, Mr. Nasser, the CEO of Aramco, uh, speaking about the integration of, energy, of, uh, of technology in Aramco and how a center in Bahrain, with the help and assistance of satellites, can actually control all the operations of 
of Aramco. How do you see that from your perspective? Absolutely. And, and that's not only as it relates to fossil fuels, but to new energies as well. Uh, so, so efficiencies, artificial intelligence, machine learning, investing in new technologies, continuing to drive down the cost of solar and wind. You know, one of the great challenges I think that we have from a technology perspective is how to bring the size of offshore wind turbines onshore. They'll, the, if we can do that, it will have the effect of reducing the levelized cost of energy dramatically. All of these things can be enhanced by technology. When you think about battery storage, how batteries work in electric vehicles, there is a huge technology investment that is required to continue to drive the cost of these technologies down to the point where they can be more, wide, more widely adopted. So when we look at any particular infrastructure investment, Technology is a huge part of the investment proposition. And this is where government can significantly drive investment. I think government R&D is critical. When you look at the, the two great uh, examples of US government investment, the Manhattan Project and the, the race to the moon in the 1960s, were significantly funded by government. There's no reason why energy technology cannot be a government R&D expense, and doing that in partnership with the private sector. I'll move to Brendan quickly. Brendan, what are the uh, priority investments that you see need to be done in this post-pandemic era? Thanks, Bassam, and hello, everybody from Washington, D.C. Um, it's an honor to share the stage virtually with, with my co-panelists. Co um, the way I think about the question, Bassam, is, is what should infrastructure investment be looking like after the pandemic? And that drives the priorities and the, the, the what and the how. So the first word that I think of is bold. And nothing, I think, embodies that more than the kingdom's NEON project, which is fundamentally about building the city of the future. It gets to your questions around innovation and technology. This is one of the most transformative projects ever undertaken anywhere in the world ever. We're incredibly proud to be a partner on the NEOM effort. Um, in conjunction with that, and because of the opportunity that we see in the kingdom, I'm also excited to announce now that we're moving Bechtel's regional headquarters to Riyadh. Um, this, is, this is building upon our 75 plus years of partnership in the kingdom, and we're really excited about the opportunity and um, for, for infrastructure investment and innovative infrastructure investment for many years to come. I like the example of NEOM for answering your question because it highlights three major areas which I think are priorities around the world right now um, for the post-pandemic infrastructure wave. The first is clean energy. NEOM is going to be 100% renewable energy in a highly integrated system with a smart electric grid. It's focused on commercializing clean energy industries like green hydrogen. The second, which um, my co-panelists have talked about already, is digital infrastructure, so key for enabling autonomous vehicles high-speed transit, like Josh has talked about, and other smart city applications. And then the third, which maybe is a longer-term investment, but so critical for humanity, is water infrastructure. And NEOM is really, I think, leading the world in evaluating multiple innovative technologies for desalination and wastewater treatment. Once these are scaled, these are going to be examples for the world to follow, which is why we're so excited. Now, the post-pandemic period is an opportunity to rethink not just what we invest in from an infrastructure perspective, but how we go about it. And the two reforms that I think really need to be part of that going forward, one is making sure that we get the right balance of risk between the public sector and the private sector. I know that's something Matt shares my passions around. Um, and, and then the second really is it's about getting the best value for the public. So there's a lot of talk about ESG and social and environmental benefits, but we don't see that show up in procurement decisions or, or procurement evaluations as much. We'd like to see that become more prominent and more of a differentiator. Um, so to come back full circle, um, you know, this the traditional approach to infrastructure investment and how infrastructure projects get delivered, it's not going to lead to the kind of bold, innovative projects the world needs. So it's how do we focus on not just the what, but also the how side of infrastructure investments. I think you answered my, my second question, which was the future of social architecture. Thank you very, very much. I want to go back to Mr. Al-Abbar. I have very few minutes left. I want to ask you, sir, you've been working, you've been delivering a dream for the last 20-something years. You're a visionary, you've worked with visionaries, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed. When you look at Saudi Arabia today, NEOM, the sectors, sports, entertainment, technology, 
the tens of thousands of people who are watching us right now want to hear what Mohammed Al Abbar thinks about Saudi Arabia today. Well, uh, first, uh, I would like to say that I am so impressed with the people they select. For me, that means everything. And my chairman, in Noon, is one of the uh, most incredible people I work with, uh, His Excellency Yasser Ramayan. So I would say, number one, is that they are selecting the right people. It means we are on the right track. Number two, Saudi Arabia need to catch up. Saudi Arabia have not done a lot of stuff for a long, long time. Hard infrastructure, soft infrastructure. So if you talk about Neom, we think it's necessary because we need to catch up. Uh, and I really would like to congratulate them for being brave, for being bold, and for sticking to the plan. And that's very impressive from day number one. The good thing about this country is that they review it, they put a plan, and you can tell somebody's executing. And that is something that not many people can do globally. So congratulations. Thank you, sir. Josh, one last word about the future of social architecture, infrastructure, sorry. I think for me, it's, it's as Your Excellency said, it's the ability to leapfrog. You know, this 20th century was powered by the oil that came from this region. The 21st century is going to be powered by the ideas, the innovation that come from this region. And I think this is the opportunity to take that, to invest it as we go forward, and to really make the the next century look completely different than the last, powered by, you know, not oil anymore, but the ideas that come from us, our children's children, and, and beyond. And I think Neom embodies that, and I think this opportunity to execute and deliver, um, I couldn't be more excited about doing business here. Thank you very much. Um, one last question for Abu Rashid, because I have not heard uh, you say something about what the next two years are going to look like in the Middle East. What do you expect? We'd like to hear your expectations once we are over this COVID-19. Are you optimistic? Uh, do you think it, things it are going to move back quickly? Dr. Basim, you are a partner of mine. We've been through so much in the Middle East. And you know, the, the West look at us and they say, you know, the Middle East is very volatile and not stable and we're not going to invest. And I tell them, that's fine. I'm not going to convince you, leave all these opportunities for us in the Middle East. But I, simply, uh, one will say that, um, you know, we have to learn from the Spanish flu. And we have to learn what happened after the Spanish flu, that incredible boom. Of course, it's a completely different situation, but it's similar. So I am quite excited about the region. I'm expanding in all of the industries that I operate in, if it's real estate, if it's our food business, or if it's our e-commerce business. Um, and, and again, I guess people like us, will, and like many of you, we basically have to learn. I think we are learning every month, every week, how to cope and change and, and be able to cope with it and move forward. But in general, I'm very optimistic. Thank you, sir. I hope your optimism rubs on all of us. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for being with us. And uh, I thank the audience for bearing with us. Good evening. Thank you, sir. Thank you.